I've been working on Clusterio 2.0 for around two years now, and I want to show the progress that has been made and where the software is now. What I've got set up right now is the web interface for 2.0 Alpha 7. And I'll log in with an authentication token. A lot of the work has gone into making remote management one of the core features of Clusterio. As you can see, I can go into the master tab and both see and modify the configuration of the master server while it's running. Though half of these settings require a restart to take effect. I can also change the configuration for plugins, but more on that later. The way slaves work has changed from how they worked in the 1.x versions of Clusterio. They now more or less represent one physical computer that the Clusterio master can remotely control and run Victoria servers on. As you can see here, I have one Clusterio slave named local that is connected to my cluster. And with that set up, I can now create and run Factorio servers, which are called instances in Clusterio. The process is really simple. All I have to do is create a new instance, give it a new, give it a name, and assign it to a slave. In this case, local is the one I have. I now have a Factorio server that's ready to run. And when I click start, it will create a new save with the default map settings, a random seed, and start it. I can of course also stop the server. And the save it created is shown in the list of saves. There's also the option to upload a save, clicking the button and browsing for it. Or as this is a modern web interface, simply drag and drop it. I can also create a save manually by providing the map settings as JSON or a map exchange string. Or even convert a map exchange string and edit it. As you can see, perhaps the player wanted a water world and gave a map exchange string for it. But this being multiplayer, I want the research queue to be available from the start, but the player who made the exchange string didn't turn that option off. With Clusterio, I can convert the settings to the human-readable JSON format and change the research queue to be available from the start, which is done by setting the option to always in the JSON. Now, I have a new save that I decided to make in the list. And the arrow next to it indicates that it will be loaded when I click start. By default, the save with the latest timestamp is loaded when starting an instance. But I can also click on a save to choose to delete it, download it, or load it directly on the server. I'll click load to start the server using this save. Now, if I go to Factorio and browse the LAN games list, I should see the server pop up as it's located in my local network. And indeed we do. If I join now, we can see it's the water world that I just created. And the research queue is available from the start of the game. Going back to the web interface again, we can see one of my favorite features and the console, the server output is colored, making it easy to skim through. If I scroll through, I can easily find an error, such as this one, where it said it failed to publish the server on, this, on the public server list because we're missing an API token. Scrolling down, I have all of the configuration for the Factorio server available, including what port to run it on and the server settings to use. And a nice thing about this is that where it's possible, the changes are applied to the running server. So for example, if I go back to the LAN games list and choose to change the name, to say Water Nexus, and click Apply, the name of the running server will change. And if we look back at the 
Serverless is now called Water Nexus. Pretty neat. Hmm? There's also the option to synchronize admin, whitelist, and panelist with the cluster, and that allows for centrally managing these lists with ease for all of the service in the cluster. To show this, I'll go to the Users tab and click on my own user, and there's toggles for admin, whitelist, and a button to ban it. So if I, ex for example, click on admin, but before I do that, I will log back in. You can see that I'm immediately demoted by the server as it's synchronized. There's also a role and permission system for the Clusterio interface where you can grant user roles and the roles they have determine what actions they can do. The default player role, for example, only has a limited viewing access to the cluster. You could use this system to, for example, create a moderator role that allows you to start and stop instances, but not delete them. You may have noticed there's no gameplay changing elements to Clusterio 2.0, and that is because those functionalities were moved into plugins for Clusterio. This means you can run Clusterio 2.0 as a server manager for vanilla Factorio service, but also pick and choose which plugins with extra gameplay features you want to use. For this demonstration, I've chosen to only install the Discord Bridge plugin, which allows sharing chat between the Discord channel and the Factorio service. To set, up, to set it up, I made a Discord bot, put the token in the config, and joined it to my Discord server. Now all I'll need to do is configure the channel it bridges the chat to by copying the ID of it. And that's it. I now have two-way chat between Discord and Factorio. which I would say is pretty good. The web interface is also made to be responsive and work on anything from tablet size down to mobile screens while still being functional. Finally, there's also a command line interface where you can do any of the actions the web interface allows you to do but from the command. For example, I can stop the instance I just created without having to use the web interface. Just like the web interface, this is a remote management tool and can be run on a remote computer. That more or less wraps it up for now. You can find links to the project page and Clusterio Discord server in the comments for this video.